Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Peak Human Podcast, where our goal is to help you become the strongest, leanest, and healthiest version of yourself by adopting the Sapien Lifestyle. My name is Brian Sanders, and if you don't know what the Sapien Lifestyle is all about, head on over to sapien.org and get our free lifestyle guide when you sign up for the newsletter. If you're already living the Sapien Lifestyle, you can hang out with other people at the Sapien Tribe. Join there at sapien.org. We got all kinds of cool stuff going on in our private community. And if you need help getting started with the Sapien Lifestyle, Dr. Gary and I created a 10-week program to guide you along the way. It's really easy to follow. We got videos. We got a free health coach call included. So get this at sapien.org. So far, I don't take any outside advertisers to the podcast. It's all supported through sapien.org and my company knows the tail.org where we do 100% grass-fed and finished beef, regeneratively raised, holistically managed here in Texas. Go to nosetail.org. You can create your own box. We got primal ground beef with organs mixed in. This is our flagship product, kidney, heart, liver, and spleen, all in the ground beef. Don't have to taste it. Don't have to mess with it. Just get all the nutrition from it. This stuff is super good, super nutrient-dense, good for you and for the environment, all at nosetail.org. We also have freshly ground spices that I developed just for our meats. We have body care products made from beef tallow, soaks right up in your skin, it's what your body needs. Soap, skin food, lip balm, this truly is what human skin needs, animal fat for your animal body. And of course we got biltong, the South African meat snack, air dried, super soft, no sugar, no curing agents, just grass fed meat, on the go, it's great. This is all at nosetail.org. If you are new to the podcast, be sure to start back at episode one, so many great guests, it's like getting a free master's course in human nutrition. I've had the best and brightest minds, doctors, scientists, regenerative ag, everything you need to become a peak human. If you're a regular listener, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing with a friend. Thanks for giving a review on any podcast app you listen to. Go to the Food Lies YouTube channel to watch all these with the video version. And while you're there, the Food Lies YouTube channel, you can see the preview we made, the intro to the Food Lies docuseries. It turned into a six-part series. It's an amazing, amazing intro that we spent a year making as we made the film, handmade almost every shot. You're really not going to want to miss this one. It's very special. We're trying to finish the film soon, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, please enjoy this great episode. Today, my guest is Ty Beal, who is based in Washington, D.C. as a research advisor and the knowledge leadership team at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN. In this role, he supports programs, research, evaluation, and dissemination of knowledge to stakeholders. He has extensive experience examining sustainable food systems, diet quality, food affordability, food supplies, micronutrient deficiencies, child growth and development, non-communicable diseases, and global health. He obtained a PhD in geography with emphasis in global nutrition from the University of California, Davis, where he was a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. You probably heard me mention Ty Beal's work with Chris Kresser on one of the latest podcasts, and I've been posting about his work for over a year now. He's doing some great stuff to expose the big nutrient deficiencies, the big problem with our food quality, especially in other countries, but it very much affects people in the US and developed countries because everyone is deficient in nutrients. This is a huge problem. It's a nutrient leverage hypothesis we get into. I think it's so huge. We talk about it in the film. Protein, nutrients, so important. It's why people overeat, I think. It's why we have so many problems. People are starving for good nutrition. And in the modern food system, they're not getting it. And that all goes to the protein and the nutrients and the processing. So please enjoy this one with Ty Beal. Make sure to go to nosetail.org, get all your regenerative meat, all your body care, and go to saving.org to get the free lifestyle guide. Sign up for our newsletter, connect with us directly. Only one email per week, good stuff, valuable info, discounts, etc. Check it out and enjoy this show with Ty Beal. All right. Hello, Ty Beal. How's it going? Hey, it's going well, Brian. How are you? I'm awesome. It's good to be talking to you. We are familiar with each other's work on it, on social media, I guess. I've been following your Twitter for a while, done great stuff to push back against some of these weird studies that have been published about <laughs> nutrition. And well, yeah, you're a global health nutrition researcher. Tell us more about yourself. Oh, yeah. So I got into uh, research because I was interested in uh, my own personal health and I had to kind of overcome some nutritional challenges that I did on my own. And I got pretty interested in the power of nutrition to um, really transform health. Um, But then I was really interested in this kind of global perspective of trying to address big 
issues worldwide, you know, people who are suffering from malnutrition, uh, really affecting their daily lives, stunted children, um, not developing and growing properly. So I got really interested in that. Um, and I ended up joining a, a global NGO. So my organization, GAIN, Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, seeks to improve nutrition and diets worldwide. So it's really right up my alley because I get to do a mix of research, but focused on program and practical needs uh, worldwide. Yeah, I love your worldwide perspective because usually we're just kind of focused on our own stuff. And I do get focused on just our little community or just the U.S. in general. And then I have to remember that there's other people out there. And yeah, I mean, the third world countries, if that's what they're still called, developing nations, they're having the worst problems, right? So most people don't really care about nutrients, but it's, I guess, the most important thing. What do you think? Depends on the context. I think uh, essential nutrients are essential for a reason because we need them and, and we know that there are deficiencies all over the place. Uh, but certainly there are issues of these chronic diseases like, you know, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. I think it's sort of related and there, there could be an approach where you address both of those things. We probably can talk about that. But yeah, I think to, to varying degrees, the type of nutritional issues vary around the world. But one thing is for sure, diets are not healthy in any country. And malnutrition, when you I say the word malnutrition, it's not just these like undernutrition deficiencies, stunting. It's really also includes uh, diet related diseases like diabetes, heart disease, obesity. So really, it's it's a problem everywhere. And I think it just really depends on the context, which problem is uh, you know most concerning. Yeah, I guess if you're thinking about chronic disease and obesity, it's more it's more directly related to things other than nutrients, but, and I always kind of add those in. I'm like, well, why are people overeating so much? You know? And then you're like, I get into the nutrient leverage hypothesis, which I don't know if it's a real thing. I, I think I talked about with Chris Kresser, uh, who we both know, but you know, the protein leverage hypothesis. And what do you think about the nutrient leverage hypothesis? And w does that cause people to overeat? Yeah, so I well, I think there is a there is um, clear evidence showing that people who are obese um, actually are at increased risk of nutrient deficiencies, which I think is quite surprising to many people because you don't think about, you know, you're eating a lot of calories or extra calories, and w why would you not be meeting your nutrient needs? I think a lot of that has to do with the nutrient density of that diet. You know, ultra processed foods, uh, which are just energy dense and really nutrient poor, certainly. Uh, I think, pro, you know, I, I don't have a lot to say about the those um, hypotheses, but really just, I think, in terms of satiety, protein, I think it's pretty important, you know, along with fiber and water content, a lot of other things. So I, I, th I certainly think, um, and, and nutrients, you know, in animal studies, animals eat for nutrients, right? They don't have dietitians who are necessarily telling them, wild animals don't have dietitians <laughs> telling them what to eat, right? They They pick out foods to eat that will meet their nutrient needs. And we are animals too. So I think there is an aspect of that, you know, if we're deficient in nutrients, we keep eating. We, we want to, you know, in a natural environment, maybe where we don't have this modern day food environment, we would uh, probably seek out the appropriate foods if we can access them. The problem is what we have access to is like Cheetos and big gulps <laughs> and French fries, right? So it's, it's not really working for us. Our, our um, genetics are not really working for us on, in this new environment that we're in. Yeah, our senses are off. I interviewed Mark Schatzker twice, actually. I'm sure you're probably aware of him, the Dorito effect. And he, he talks okay. about a lot of this stuff. And yeah, the animal studies are huge. Talked about Dr. Pred Favenza about this stuff, Stefan Van Vliet, um, a lot of people that you know. and. Man, uh, we're overfed and undernourished. That's the thing too with the obesity, right? It's we're in this crazy time in history where people can obese and be obese and malnourished at the same time. And yeah. I guess that's directly with the food environment, right? It's like you have no chance if all the food you're eating has no nutrients in it and it's just stuffed with processed whatever. Of course, how how could you get, meet your needs of nutrition without overeating? Yeah, you can't. And I think you, you nailed it there. It's really this food environment. It's, 
you know, I think there's, there's some individual responsibility for sure, but largely it's like these foods are designed to be super addicting, you know, hyper palatable, make you want more, never want to stop eating, right? They're food chemists behind these things. And we live, we, you're sort of exposed to um, a lot more unhealthy foods and marketing and advertising all that than you are these nutritious, wholesome diets. So it's hard. It's just a hard context to be in and, and, and be healthy in. Well, yeah. And people are concerned about money too. And all the cheapest foods are the most nutrient poor foods. And yeah, people don't know better. I think, yeah, it's, it's half of it's education and half of it's just actually doing it because you could, not many people know all the stuff that you and I know and people listening to this podcast, but even if they did know, oh, wait, so you know, beef liver and shellfish are really nutrient dense. I should be eating those instead of brownies. Still, then the second half is who's who's going to do it, <laughs> right? It's like, it's hard to get people to yeah. do it. It's like this whole psychological side or, you know, behavior side. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess that's not what you get into. <laughs> that whole side is, is someone else's problem. You're just studying all this stuff. Well, yeah, let's talk about the stuff you study. Uh, the main study that people may know you from is the study that looks at the, what is it? Six most important nutrients on a worldwide level and their nutrient density and all that. Yeah. I think that question of what people know me by depends on the audience, right? So I think your listeners, mm -hmm. it's probably that, um, certainly. So that study came out in March of this year is so a 20, no, March of last year. Well, this year, I don't remember anyways, it was, I think it was <laughs> this year. Before. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So the reason that we did this um, research is because you know I had done previous work with UNICEF, so that's a, a United Nations organization that works on on you know child health, and they were really interested in learning about the gaps in the diet for young children. So these are you know young children is in this definition sort of six to twenty three months where you're, you're just starting to eat solid foods, they have incredibly high nutrient requirements and they're really vulnerable to the um, consequences of poor nutrition during that, that um, time. And so we did a study, you know, we did studies where we looked at the nutrient gaps um, in different countries in Africa and South Asia. And there was a uh, pretty consistent evidence around six of these nutrients. Um, you know, there, there are 29 essential micronutrients and a lot of those, there's just no data for. So we don't really know the full picture. So we can't say like these six are for sure the most important. But from the data we do have, these are there are common gaps in these nutrients. So these are, if I can remember correctly, this is iron, zinc, the vitamin A, it's folate, vitamin, uh, vitamin B12, and calcium. And, you know, there are other nutrients that we see deficiencies in, like uh, vitamin uh, D, for example. But you know, vitamin D, you get some through foods, you can get some through sun exposure, but we don't have a lot of data on, on that um, around the world. So yeah, we focus on those six nutrients. And uh, I mean, it's probably no surprise to you or your listeners what we found, but the most micronutrient dense foods are, you know, organs. So we actually looked at different organs like liver, kidney, heart, spleen uh, from different animals, um, small fish. So when you consume the fish with the bones and the skin and the eyes and everything, it's are, are super nutrient dense. Um, the one plant source food that made it into the sort of top list was dark green leafy vegetables. So, you know, things like kale, uh, spinach, chard, moringa, those types of things. And then bivalves are clams, mussels, oysters, and other um, shellfish like crustaceans, so shrimp, lobster, uh, and then you have the ruminant meats. So you have goat, beef, those all six grow well. Mm -hmm. um, I think eggs, uh, and then dairy products, certain dairy products, uh, and canned fish. So if you have canned fish with bones, say fatty fish like salmon or mackerel, those are also pretty nutrient dense. So those are those are what that's what we found, um, and it's pretty you know, it's pretty generalizable across contexts. Of course, the foods, specific foods available in each context may vary, but that's, um, that's what we found. Yeah. It's no surprise, all the animal foods up top and you got some leafy greens. So do you, how did you do this? Was it by calorie, by volume, by, by what, like, how did you measure this nutrient density? So we did it by calories and by mass. 
And the reason for that, of course, is because some foods are energy dense and others aren't. So dark leafy greens, for example, do not have a lot of energy in them, not, not a lot of calories. So if you're just looking at the nutrient density per calorie, you could say, wow, those are super nutrient dense. And they are. But there's also a limit to how much you can eat in terms of quantity, mm -hmm. right? You can't have like pounds and pounds and pounds of, of dark leafy greens or other foods. So uh, we, we sort of use both approaches. Um, and I could go to the methods if you want, but essentially we tried to come up with a balanced approach where if it's too much, you know, if it's too much quantity overall in terms of mass, it's not going to get the highest score. If it's too much, too much in terms of calories required to sort of provide this nutrient density, it's not going to get the highest score. So, uh, yeah, we use a, a, a combined approach. Um, well, yeah, that makes sense. I, I was trying to do my own years ago for the food lies film and, I mean, I mean, we're still working on it and we still actually need to find out some good way to do this because everyone has their own idea of nutrient density and there's so many ways to do it. Maybe you can help me offline on, on how we can do this because we need to just present something to the world that this is how we do it and this is generally acceptable because I don't trust the other side. We'll, we'll get into the tough study and the food compass and they have their own way and somehow their way has Cheerios and you know all this stuff above meat and eggs. So it's you know, yeah. obviously there's some really wild ways to do it. And then, yeah, you have to think of portion size. It's like, what do you, I mean, do you, did that take into consideration like an average portion size? I mean, that stuff's like available online. Like what is the average portion size of meat or of kale? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we didn't look at portion sizes. We really, we fit the metric a little bit differently. So, uh, you know, we are looking at the quantity in calories and grams to provide an average of one third of the recommended intakes of these six nutrients. And uh, there's a lot of different approaches to this. We also limited, we, you know, we didn't want foods super high in one nutrient to just dominate that because you can have, a, you know, if you're looking at an average across nutrients, if it's say, really high in vitamin A, like a, a orange flesh, sweet potato or liver, that basically that nutrient is just going to say, oh, this is super nutrient dense because it just has this one nutrient, but we wanted to have a more even balance of mm -hmm. nutrients. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 I think the, the, the way that like sort of, I think it makes it more accessible to people is showing the sort of bar graph of the quantity required to meet that sort of target value of nutrients. And that's, what's sort of shocking. You see these like very tiny bars for things like liver. It's like, you know, 11 grams or, or 11 calories or something like that to meet this target yeah. compared to like, you know, hundreds for you know, or thousands for some of these nuts and seeds or whole grains or whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, when you mentioned the food compass and we, we can talk about it, but that's more of a food rating system. So it's not just nutrient density, of course, it's looking at other dietary factors. The study that uh, we did that we've been talking about is really just focused on these uh, micronutrients and the density of those nutrients. So a lot of different ways to look at it. And we are not saying that these foods are the... Um, like necessarily the healthiest foods overall are the ones that need to be always prioritized. There's all, a lot of different reasons to consume foods, but these are the, the ones that are most dense in the bioavailable micronutrients that are commonly lacking worldwide. Well, yeah, that's important. It's so someone, I think someone asked me on social media recently. Oh, so which are the, show me the list. Cause they heard Chris Kresser talking about it in the podcast I did last week and he was listing them and someone thought that all you had to do was eat everything on that list and all day, every day or something, right. you know, and that, <laughs> that's just not how it works. But how it doesn't work is people putting their own spin on it, which we will get to the food compass because they put in their own qualities of food that, that give negative scores or they're, they're putting outdated information, I'd say about say saturated fat as something that makes foods not desirable. But I'm going to tease that a little more because you mentioned nutrient um, bioavailability. We got to talk about bioavailability and anti nutrients because I saw some cool stuff on the phytates or the, the phytic acid content of foods that you guys looked at. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's one of the different things about our study is, uh, you know, some nutrients have bioavailability built into the indicator. So, an example of this is uh, vitamin A. Uh, there's a automatic assumption when you're looking at vitamin A, um, that the vitamin A in plant source foods, these are carotenoids, so something, you know, dark leafy greens, orange, sweet potato, those types of foods, 
it's about um, one twelfth of the bioavailability of retinol, which is found in animal source foods. So it's already built in there. You don't need to adjust. Of course, it varies depending on the context, but um, that that in, that nutrient itself, you don't really need to adjust. But the two nutrients that it's not built in are iron and zinc, and it's actually uh, quite important uh, to adjust because iron and zinc are significantly impacted by anti-nutrients and by the type of iron. So whether it's heme iron, which is found in uh, animal source foods or non-heme iron uh, found in plant, plant source foods. So uh, I think maybe the reason people don't try to adjust is because there's a lot of factors that influence that uh, bioavailability and, you know, individuals have different, um, different ways to absorb depending on their own individual, um, you know, genetics and their status. So the iron status, but I think the risk of doing nothing at all is far greater than saying we're going to do some adjustment here. So yeah, I can get into details if you want, but essentially we, we did. Yeah. Well, yeah, tell us more. Yeah. This is what it's all about. My crowd's about okay. it. Okay. You want to get into it? Okay. <laughs> Let's go for it. So well, yeah, because people, okay. Just quickly, a lot, a lot of people, well, a lot of people don't know about this at all. Anti-nutrients are this whole new thing. If you're not a nerd about this stuff, you have no idea. Okay. And then if you are a nerd, there's still more nuances that, that people are curious about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll get into it. So um, we didn't look at the whole spectrum of antinutrients. So, um, you know, phytate is one, and that's that's something that binds to minerals like iron and zinc, and it hinders their absorption. But, you know, you have oxalates, you have tannins, all sorts of other antinutrients. So I'll just say, um, you know, what we did. For iron, we looked at uh, the amount of heme iron that was found in a... Um, food. And there are studies that show, you know, ruminant meat, for example, so beef, goat, lamb, mutton, those types of things, they contain about two thirds uh, heme iron out of all the iron that that they contain. And this varies. So I think fish and poultry is it's, it's quite a bit lower, closer to like 25%. Um, I think pork is around 40%. So different, different animal source foods have different amounts. Now the the amount of uh, the bioavailability of heme iron is uh, much higher um, than non heme iron, and so we adjusted. So we just basically said we looked at the amount of heme iron and made an, an estimate of what we wanted to, uh, you know, what we found for the estimated bioavailability. Now we kind of favored uh, we favored being conservative in the sense that we assumed that plant sources of uh, non heme iron. So this is in like pulses, like beans, peas, lentils, dark leafy greens. We assumed that that was about 10% bioavailable. Now it totally varies. Like, uh, in many contexts, that's, it's probably lower than that. Um, uh, but maybe higher for some people. And it depends on if you have, you know, you have vitamin C, do you have animal protein in the diet, which can help increase that non heme iron absorption. So, but we just used an average and, and what we found is about uh, ruminant meat has about twice the amount, uh, twice the bioavailability. Mm -hmm. I think it's pr potentially even higher. It just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. So that's like, let's, you know, iron in something like beef is about 20% bioavailable compared to, um, in, you know, in a, in a plant source food. So it's about double the bioavailability. Now, if you don't adjust for that, that's an order of magnitude, right? So it's like, that's a pretty big impact on the findings. Um, so for zinc, we really just use phytate. So the amount of phytate in the food uh, being a, a proxy for the bioavailability. And when you look at the recommended intakes for zinc in different contexts globally, there is a standard that looks at, you know, kind of separates foods into, or, or the diet into four different categories, you know, very high in phytate, very low in phytate. And that can range um, anywhere from, I think, 40 something percent, 44 percent by available on a, you know, a very refined diet, so something like the U.S. diet where you don't have a lot of phytate, and down to twenty six percent on a um, unrefined diet. So, lots of phytate from whatever it is, uh, pulses, seeds, nuts, um, and I, I'm not like I don't think phytate in itself is um, is necessarily a bad thing. It depends on how much in, in the context, uh, but it certainly has an impact on the bioavailability of these minerals. So 
for zinc, it's about, I think it's about a 70% difference if you look at something like, again, beef compared to pulses uh, like lentils or beans. So we adjusted for that, um, that average difference. And what that does is that if a, let's just say a lentil and beef contain the same amount of iron and the same amount of zinc. Well, the actual quantity, the quantity of that food that you need, the, that lentil is actually about, you know, 50% to 100% more than beef, even though it has the same content, because it's not going, your body's not going to absorb that the same way. So that's the adjustment we made. It's not perfect, but it's something. And I think that really helped to show the value of animal source foods, which is, um, I think, important because there's often a push globally to reduce animal source foods as much as possible or from some circles, you know, eliminate animal source foods for different reasons. And we, you know, we want to really show the risk in doing that. Well, that's why your work's so important. I feel like you're one of the few groups that are doing this stuff, reasonable work that we all kind of know. And I, it's just so confusing to me and people I know and people who listen to this show, like why there's this big push against animal foods when it's very clear scientifically that they're super healthy, super nutrient dense, bioavailable. It just, it doesn't make sense. So you guys are doing accurate science and, and making adjustments while the other side is doing basically the opposite. They're, they're penalizing meat. It, it's just, it's very strange to me. I don't know. Do you think it's to do with like who's funding the stuff or is it personal biases? You know, people who are against meat in general. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. Ethical. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, of course there's the, the ethical folks who don't think that it's ethical to consume any meat, right? Any sort of animal source food. You can't really argue with that. I mean, you can, you're just not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the mainstream sort of, I would say the, the people having the biggest influence, um, you know, politically and um, worldwide, when you think about climate and environmental issues, I think there's this concern of, of loss of biodiversity, climate change. And there's, uh, you know, animal source foods have an impact, just like all food, of course, animal source foods have an impact. And there's a lot of, I think, unsustainable production practices of animal source foods that are contributing uh, to major uh, environmental destruction. But um, there's, uh, I think there's sort of a predominant opinion of from environmental scientists, mainstream environmental scientists that, you know, well, that means we just need to really transition to mostly just plant source foods. And that's the solution. But I think there's a lot of examples of ways to incorporate livestock into sustainable food systems, right? So agro, agroecology, diverse food systems, permaculture, uh, circular food systems and uh, farms where you're basically making use of crop residues, byproducts, waste, recycling that, circulating that through a ruminant that can, uh, you know, convert that into nutrient dense meat and milk and also fertilize a plant. So I think there are ways to do that. I, 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 for me, I'm sort of in the middle. I, I see concerns. I don't think we can just have as much as we want worldwide. You know, there, there are reasons to moderate. Um, but I think that the, the sort of mainstream view of let's reduce, reduce, reduce as much as possible. I think that's really problematic for uh, a lot of reasons. And on the nutrition side, we see deficiencies even in high income countries, right? Like the U S and the UK, we see pretty high prevalence of deficiencies. So, uh, I don't think that's fully uh, appreciated and the risk of trying to reduce these animal source foods, um, I mean, it's, it's just going to, it's going to reduce the nutrients in our food supply. It's going to increase people's risk of deficiencies because I mean, you know, this animal source foods, plant source foods, they have complementary nutrient profiles. If you just have one or the other, you're not, you're going to be missing out generally on nutrients that, that you need. So it's really important, I think, to maintain some level of animal source foods in the diet and the food system overall. Well, absolutely. That's a lot of the work you do. Maybe you can throw out some other stats because I know you have some good stats on worldwide deficiencies. I saw some on Twitter thread recently. Some of them are crazy, like nine out of 10 in women, young women of certain ages in certain countries like India are deficient in at least one micronutrient. It's quite shocking, actually. 
even though I expected to see pretty high levels, uh, to, to when it actually came came out and we saw the results, it's like wow, nine and in ten in in many of these countries in in uh, you know, South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa are deficient in one or more micronutrients. Many of them are deficient in multiple. So you may have iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, folate deficiency, all at the same time. Um, yeah, those are the pretty pretty shocking numbers. <clears throat> I think what's also surprising for a lot of people is how high deficiencies are in high-income countries. So in the U.S., um, about one in three women are deficient in at least one nutrient. In the U.K., it's one in two women, so half over half the population. Mm-hmm. Um, iron, iron deficiency alone was over 20% in the U.S. and the U.K. for women. One in five women, that's pretty high. Um, you don't really hear that talked about, I don't think. You know, in the U.S., people are not talking about, oh, we, we have all these nutrient deficiencies and you eat more nutrient-dense foods, right? It's not a common narrative um, outside of, you know, this community of maybe ancestral health. Um, in the U.K., folate deficiency and vitamin D deficiency were also really high, around 20% for women. So globally, if you look worldwide, two in three women have at least one deficiency, it's like the large majority of women worldwide have a deficiency. And we don't have the data on men to do that estimate. But I would expect, um, given some other data that's out there, I would expect it to be relatively close. Probably at least one in two men have a deficiency. Mm-hmm. And you've got to remember, we're, we're only looking at a handful of nutrients. Um, if we had data on all 29 essential micronutrients, what would that prevalence oh, be? I mean, would it just be like 99% of the population? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I say there's only I think only one percent of the population is eating a a real healthy diet. In my opinion, I don't I don't think there's that many people out there who are really avoiding processed foods, eating great you know nutrient dense animal source foods and other whole foods. I mean, that's a very specific diet that I know you know a hundred people around Austin eat. <laughs> like, I don't know who eats the diet. That's true. I would not be surprised if most people. Like the large majority of people are, you know, deficient. I think that's probably probably a reality. Well, and and these deficiencies are all stemming from not the animal sourced foods, not eating enough of those. I mean, that's you're talking about iron, zinc, B12, like different amino acids, probably with protein in general. That's what people are missing, and the worldwide message is eat less animal foods. It's, it's really crazy. It's like, I was thinking about it today too. The, the world, if you're looking at a world level, if you're talking about all these different countries, the developing countries, and they are kind of eating a whole food plant-based diet. It's like, I mean, yes, some of it's refined grains, but you know, a lot of it is just, they're already eating whole plant foods. That's all they have. That's not the problem. Their, their problem is not enough animal source foods. And then there, there's other people that are eating too many processed foods. So it's like the, 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 the more you know, developed countries, they're eating too many processed foods. The underdeveloped countries just aren't getting enough animal food. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's definitely, I think y- your point. So iron and zinc are are common worldwide, every almost every country. Mm-hmm. I don't think in our study in children and women, and so this is preschool age children and, and women of reproductive age, no country was less than ten percent for zinc deficiency. Not the U.S., not the U.K., oh. no country. So um, you're absolutely right. Those the, those are most, um, you know, the top sources in terms of density and bioavailability are animal source foods. Uh, but folate was also really high. Um, and, of course, folate is in liver, so very high in liver, but most people aren't eating liver. So the, the top sources of folate um, really are, are pulses and dark green leafy vegetables. So I think there is there is a sort of uh, underconsumption of animal source foods in many contexts. So when you look at um, most of Africa, most of South Asia, parts of southeastern Asia, animal source food consumption is very low, um, and I think that's a that's a problem. And, and iron and zinc are pretty um, pretty key deficiencies in those areas. You also see folate deficiency in these areas, and you know what there. It's not the case that all of these populations have access to uh, dark green leafy vegetables, fruits and vegetables rich in folate. Um, pulses, they're they're you know they're more affordable, but they're not consumed in high amounts in in many of these contexts. Not not things like lentils and beans. 
So I think it's a mix. You're absolutely right, though. Like the message, I think it's kind of interesting. If you look at like certain countries like India and different countries in South Asia, you're like, well, it's a plant based diet. That's, you know, you know, minimally, pro- a lot of it's minimally, minimally processed. Um, well, look at the nutritional situation there. You've got nine in 10 women, adolescents uh, with a deficiency. You look at the cardio metabolic disease risk factors. You have, I think, one in three at least adolescents with, with one or more of these um, cardiometabolic risk factors. So they're not, um, they're not the sort of uh, ideal picture of a healthy diet, right? And I think um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. But ultimately, if we try to shift towards just, let's just reduce animal source foods all over the place, I think the people who are going to suffer the most are going to be those populations in Africa and South Asia where consumption is already really low. Why would you reduce further? <laughs> You're only going to have a negative impact, right? Like that's not, the, that's not the, that's not the right approach. Now, I don't think, I don't think that means in some contexts we need to consume less. I think there are certain animal source foods, maybe processed meat in the U S where we need to consume less, or it would be a public health benefit to consume less. And there are shortages of things like nuts and seeds and certain plant, whole plant foods that I think could be beneficial to increase. But yeah, this whole like global narrative of like, all right, we're in the West and we think the solution is to go plant-based. So for, you know, health and environmental reasons. So we're going to try to push this agenda of reducing. I don't think that's the right approach for so many reasons. <laughs> Not at all. That's why it's so confusing to me when I look at this world situation. And that's why I always have to go put my tinfoil hat on, you know, because I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense. So what's the other agenda? There's got to be more agendas going on, whether it be, big food manufacturers funding stuff or these people trying to centralize power or food systems? Are they trying to push their ethic? I don't know what there's gotta be more going on because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of political agenda. There's, there's, there's funding certainly that influences. um, But I I don't know. I'm not as, I'm not quite as well. I'm jaded about the industry and about corruption, all of that, but I'm not as jaded about the scientists themselves. I think they're doing what they think is sort of um, the right approach. You know, even some of the scientists who are funded by, by industry, I think they would probably still have this similar mm-hmm. conclusions if they weren't funded. They're probably, they're probably behind what they're producing. I just think some of them can be misguided, you know, and there's what, what there's a lack of checks and balances, right? So it's like, you can publish a study with all of your colleagues that agree with what your view, Mm -hmm. right? And you can kind of say whatever you think the data say, what the evidence is, but where is the check and balance? If you're, if you're a prominent researcher, kind of get away with whatever your view is. And that's sort of accepted. Um, That's why we push back on some of this stuff, right? Like if if you're sort of scratching your head, like, why is this, why is this the finding coming out of this prominent journal, (laughs) this prestigious authors, uh, what's going on here? Well, exactly. There's so much bias going on. And it's even just to continue your research, it's almost you have to play the game and just go along. And even I think people are just influenced by what we think is healthy in the mainstream. And they just make assumptions. Like there's this assumption for how long because of whatever agenda and whatever has pushed this, there's this assumption that red meat is bad and that, you know, these certain whole grains are magical. And then everyone just goes along with this. And then all of the research is kind of done under this lens. And I, I just, I don't like it. And I think it's, it's like, yeah, not to, not to mention, I don't know if you want to get into it, but maybe, maybe we talk about this. Um, when we talk about food rating systems, like food compass and others, um, yeah, yeah. what, what do you count as a whole grain? Like, I know there are a lot of views on whole grains. I'm sort of, uh, I think they're healthy, you know, minimally processed whole grains, I think are healthy for most people. Um, but, you know, Lucky Charms has whole grains in it, right? Honey Nut Cheerios is made from whole grains. Are those the same things as like oatmeal and millet? <laughs> you know, like what, what is that? Yeah. Should that be the same? You know, I think this key example of this, and this is like, oh, I mean, it's so frustrating. You look at like school meals and my daughter's in kindergarten. And you look at these school meals, which are in line with the sort of guidelines, right? Of like, you know, and you consume whole grains and all this. Again, I'm not against whole grains, but the meal is sort of like cinnamon rolls for breakfast. Like that's the, that's the healthy meal. 
Because <laughs> it's whole grains, yeah. right? Yeah, cinnamon rolls for breakfast, oh, like it turns for lunch, and you're set. And and maybe have some orange juice and strawberry or chocolate milk. I mean, that's because it's low fat, right? You can have the, the sugar and the, the milk. I mean, that's just, it's beyond frustrating to sort of, as a parent, to sort of see that, that those are the options that are being provided for our kids. It's wild. It hurts me. I post about it a lot. But let's go to the food compass. Let's hit it. Because I know you guys a great group. It's like the, the Avengers <laughs> of nutrient density uh, wrote a response to this. So a lot of guests on my podcast, you did a paper or I don't know, it's it's soon to be published. I think you said it's it's look uh, different journals looking to publish. Well, that's a whole it. story. That's, or Brian, that's a whole story there? in itself because I mean, okay. <laughs> here, wait, I'll, I'll set it up. I'll, I'll throw it to you. Okay. So just it's Fredrick Leroy. That's the, the bad yeah. pronunciation of his name. He's awesome. Stu Phillips, Stefan Von Vliet, and yourself, and I think three other people. So all guests of the show, really awesome stuff. But the, oh, well, first I got to set up even further, the food compass. So the scale is insane. It's the one we mentioned earlier. They have frosted mini wheats. We have chocolate covered almonds, orange juice, honey nut Cheerios. Like these things are at the top, all in the green with scores over 76. And then at the very bottom, oh, Lucky Charms are in the middle with a 60. <laughs> Lucky Charms get a 60. Whole eggs, fried and butter, 29. Cheddar cheese, 28. Ground beef, 26. This scale is insane. This is the food compass. Many people have posted this online. It's at a Tufts University. I don't know what kind of craziness they're doing over there. They got Darius Mazafarian, who maybe you can talk about. I think um, he's got some different views than us and yeah just tell us what happened with this whole response to that paper yeah so it's kind of um kind of interesting i was uh reading about it i had heard about the study coming out because i know um several of the authors and i was kind of looking forward to the study i was like okay let's see what this is about and i started looking into it and i started scratching my head when i saw some of the the key findings like you mentioned Orange juice with calcium, one of the top scores. Frosted mini wheats, uh, non-fat frozen yogurt, <laughs> chocolate covered almonds, honey nut Cheerios. Like these are the top. See, these are among the top scoring foods. And I was just like, well, what's? How does this happen? Um, like you said, some of these whole foods. You know, if it's an animal source food, whole egg fried in butter, bottom of the list. Cheddar cheese. You know what I had for breakfast? I had uh, whole eggs fried in butter, and I had some cheddar cheese. With some oatmeal of that. But again, like I'm I'm not gonna limit those foods. I mean, I don't, you know, I personally don't think butter is a superfood, but it's also I don't think it's like it's the most concerning food of, uh, out there. Um, but de- definitely whole eggs. Like how do you, how are you gonna penalize whole eggs or uh, nutrient dense all you know associated with with positive health outcomes? So ground beef too. Yeah, ground beef. Ground beef like the worst. Nutrient dense. Yeah, I mean this this is the thing. Like the foods you look at the foods on the bottom, oftentimes you know, some of the animal sources on the bottom, those are some of the most uh, nutrient dead sources of the nutrients that are lacking. So I see that as a problem. But you know, okay, so I'll get to this story. So we submit a um, letter to the editor, the journal, and very thoughtful, like, we, you know, like you mentioned, lots of uh, respectable colleagues, uh, co authors that we submit to, uh, who join this and we just try to raise a concern. We, we talk about, we went through kind of step-by-step step with the algorithm and, and why we felt like it's not really reflective of the evidence and, and you know, some problematic in some ways. And the editor, you know, said, oh, it's made great points, but, you know, we're not going to publish it. It doesn't meet the standard. And it was kind of like end of the story. Not to mention the authors did not respond to our comments. So we took the time to write this out. They didn't reply at all to us. I sent this to them before submitting. So I, it felt like, uh, okay, we just spent a bunch of time doing this um, and you're not going to take it seriously. It did feel a little bit like, okay, these are prominent, these are prominent scientists. Uh, they're not going to be challenged, you know, according to in this format. And what's kind of interesting is that the, uh, the comment we submitted, uh, you know, we published it as a preprint, which is just like you can submit it, what basically publish it as is what you submitted to the journal. That document has more views than the actual Food Compass article itself. It's over 20,000 views. It's just a comment. It's not even the paper. So I was sort of um, encouraged, at least, that the message is getting out there. And then a few months ago, I was like, 
maybe I should just try submitting to a different journal because, or at least reach out to some editors. So I reached out to that, to an editor at another journal and they're like, we'd love to review it. We'll definitely consider it. So it's under review. I don't know if it'll get published, but at least it's under review. Now we can have, Mm -hmm. um, you have scientists, uh, experts take a look and see if it's, it's uh, valid. So hopefully that will be at least um, something that we can get feedback on. Hopefully it'll get published and get out there. But yeah, the studies like that come out. It's hard not to be like, well, what's the, what's going on? Like, is this industry influence? Is this, um, are these just sort of anomalies? Of course, there are many foods that score, I think, appropriately on the system. You know, junk foods, really, really um, unhealthy, mm-hmm. how they process foods often score low. It's just the problem is that it's not a great system if there are dozens and dozens of examples of really bizarre foods. I mean, we could... <laughs> I could go down. We could talk more, like about some of these foods that score below those those foods. But you know, even skinless chicken breast scores um, what fifty nine. So that's like below uh, non fat frozen yogurt, uh, frosted mini wheats, orange juice, chocolate covered almonds, uh, boiled or poached egg is below is below Lucky Charms. It's better. Wait, than Lucky this is Charms. insane. <laughs> but this is insane. This is what's going on. These are how people are supposed to be making their nutrition decisions. That's the whole point of this food compass is to inform people's decisions. This is absurd. Brian, I don't get it. I mean, <laughs> some of these foods. Uh, uh, okay. How does this happen? So we have these whole egg fried and butter, cheddar cheese, ground beef in the red to be minimized. Yet above them, you have ice cream cone with nuts. So you sprinkle some nuts on an ice cream cone and it's healthy. Er is you just moderate mm-hmm. that, right? And then you have almond M&Ms. So they're, they're M&Ms with almonds, so they're healthy, right? Or you, at least you don't need to minimize them, just moderate them. Canned pineapple and heavy syrup, it's a fruit. Uh-huh. So there you go. How many, what are the nutrients in canned pineapple? Uh, about nothing, just about nothing, uh-huh. and it's tons <laughs> of sugar. How is that scoring above, a, uh, I mean, the same as a, a poached egg or a boiled egg? It just doesn't make sense. Well, that's how I know something's up. And I, I mean, it, it's a lot of things. We, we're not going to get to the bottom of it here. There's so many things that are kind of backwards in the world. It's the upside down worlds, I call it. So I, I don't know. I don't know what to do other than just push back. And I'm glad you're writing this. I'm, I can't wait to get see post about it if your thing gets approved. I hope so. You know, there were two papers that came out uh you know, I think it was the same year that were bizarre, the results, and I, we wrote letters. The, the other one, so the first one was Food Compass. The other one was a study, it was actually a really popular study in the news. It was something like each hot, each hot dog you eat will, will take away 30, 30 minutes from your life, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the headline and I was like, oh, that's interesting. There, you know, And it also talks about the, you know, the environmental impact. Well, I looked into this study. You know what the top food to add... Um, this, the study looked at foods that are going to take away healthy life and add healthy life to your to your diet. Mm-hmm. Can you think of the food that um, adds the most life to your your healthy life to your life? I mean, well, of course, you've probably seen this. So oh, you know. well, I think I do know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the health food that everyone knows adds to your life. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Is that it? Yeah. Top food. <laughs> 30, that adds 33 minutes to your life. Okay. So oh I God. like I just made a figure. Like this is the thing. You don't need to you don't even need to do like reanalysis of the data from these studies. All you need to do is take data from the study and put it in a figure to show the absurdity. And I think that's like the power of visualization, right? Like people this is this is in a table or this is just buried in a supplement, you know, file online that few people are gonna look at. Mm-hmm. You can you can actually look at this. But some of the other foods that scored you know, 33 minutes for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So by the way, so I don't have anything against peanut butter. That's just like peanuts, uh, yeah. you know, without, well, you know, added yeah. oils. Or, um, you know, even whole wheat bread, if it's like, a, you know, Ezekiel bread or something where it's just like these sprouted um, grains that are, you know, relatively nutrient dense. But uh, only 17% of whole grains in, or grains in the U.S. are whole grains. So the most of this is white bread, probably has added sugar, Tons of ingredients, um, jelly sandwiches, with tons of sugar. There's just no way that that's the the top health food. I mean, no, who who would actually say that that's the top health food? I mean, most even 
mainstream nutritionists would not say that. So I, I don't know how this happens. Um, and of course, they use the global burden of disease study evidence from you know 2016 version of the study. But things that score uh, neutral, candy, sweet bakery products, sugars, just neutral. sugar. That's neutral. There's no have, have as much candy as you want. And things that score negative. Um, poultry, minus two minutes. Eggs, minus three minutes. Red meat, so unprocessed red meat, uh, minus six minutes. And then cured meats and poultry, minus 26 minutes. So for me, it's just like, wow, like, surely, uh, you know, whole, wholesome, plant-rich foods can be healthy and are healthy and are important. Um, but like, does the evidence really say this? Is that these animal sources are taking away um, lifespan? These minimally processed animal sources are taking away healthy life, and the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with white bread and jelly mm. are adding significant amounts of life every day. Well, it's not. It's not. I'd I'd rather eat a hot dog without the bun than a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> uh, I would. What? Um, okay. This is crazy. I want to go back to stunting. This just is a, a big kind of study that really proves all the stuff we've been talking about and disproves all this craziness. Well, it is just world level data. It's it's kind of hard to prove anything. It's just a lot of correlations. But you know the the one stunting study I'm thinking of, it has the countries eating the most animal foods have the least stunting, right? And the countries eating the least animal food animal foods, the ones that are eating lower or equivalent to actually the planetary health diet, which we need to talk about, the Eat Lancet, planetary, quote, planetary health diet. So the countries that are eating that amount of meat that they're recommending have the most stunting, huge amounts of stunting. Do you, do you have this in front of you or do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I have something to say about it. So I think it's absolutely true that a shortage of animal source foods is contributing to stunting in these countries. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's randomized controlled trial evidence of the role of animal source foods. I think it's, it's super important, but the figure itself, um, it's not the strongest source of evidence. And, and here's a, here's an example I did just to, uh, so, so just to show this point, I took the, uh, the same indicator stunting, child stunting under five, and I matched it with a country level indicator of the, basically it's called the retail value of ultra processed foods per capita. So it's like how much money is spent on ultra processed foods per person in the mm -hmm. country. And you see the exact same relationship. Mm. So you could use that data. You could say, all right, so Brian, it's about the ultra processed foods. If you don't have enough ultra processed foods, you have really high stunting, so we need to eat more ultra processed foods. So that's my, my point about that data is just like these are, you know, environmental country level estimates. I don't think is the best form of evidence mm. for that. But thankfully, we have a lot of other evidence that can support the, the role of animal source foods. And we have a lot of other evidence to show the risk and harms of ultra processed foods. So I'm not at all saying yeah. uh, it's, it's the, you know, let's just go to ultra processed foods. But there's certainly, I think that sort of, I think this is what uh, the uh, vegans and plant-based advocates will sort of push back against. They'll see that study and they'll say, now, wait a minute, you're just showing a correlation at the country level. Like, how about we look at, you know, some other forms of evidence there. And I think that's a valid pushback to that study. Um, but, well, know. that's why I caveated before I, I said it. Exactly. But also, yeah. No, no, I, I'm, we're in agreement. But uh, you, you don't. You never just want to use that. But what I would say is the totality of the evidence, or you, is what you're saying. There's other randomized controlled trials that show this. There's so much other evidence out there from just the bare nutrition value of animal source foods to you know looking at it in the context of a diet. It all aligns. And what you well, I want to talk about the processed food part because you wrote that. Well, for one, consuming adequate health protective foods is not enough to counter the effects of high intakes of unhealthy foods, right? So I like that. So it's like, so the problem is these, uh, these modern countries like the US, we're eating tons of processed foods and we're also nutrient deficient. It's, it's kind of going back to the overfed and undernourished. And the bigger point I want to make is you're saying it's correlating with, with the stunting. So the people that eat the least processed foods 
apparently are still being stunted. Well, that's because they don't even have access to these processed foods. So I did visit Africa. I'm not saying I know everything about Africa. I only was in Uganda and Tanzania in you know, two specific places. And I got to see a bit of the city life and a bit of the rural life and a bit of the hunter-gatherer life. And what I saw was that they didn't have processed foods. That wasn't even an option. It was too expensive. Either they didn't have it at all or they were just far too expensive. Like McDonald's was 10 times the price of any meal that they could get locally. They were not going to McDonald's, especially in Uganda. They were not going to McDonald's. The tourists would go there, right? It was out of reach for anyone who lived there. The people who lived there, who I saw, I'm not saying I know everything about it. They were eating whole plant foods as the base of their diet. They were eating bananas and just a whole bunch of whole foods. And so the problem wasn't that they had too many processed foods. The problem was, I don't, I think there's multiple problems that I saw a bunch of like Gatorade bottles of canola oil that they were using <laughs> and they were frying stuff in this like weird cooking oil. They just call it cooking oil. And it was just a like very sketchy looking seed oil. And then they're not getting enough nutrients from animal foods. So I don't, what do you, what do you think about that? Cause it's, it's a bit of a different take on it that there, these countries, they, there's certain countries that. They're not overeating processed foods. They don't even have processed foods. Yeah. So, so I think it's important to make a distinction about the level of processing. So I don't think processing is bad. I think processing can make uh, improve nutrition, can make improvements to food safety. Um, even fortification, I think, has, has a role. Uh, but there are different types of processing, right? So there's something like, uh, you know, the, the, the grain or the... Um, you know, the meat is processed, ground, ground beef is ground. So there's some mm -hmm. process to that. Yeah. Um, you have a can of beans that's processed, but it's just like cooked and salts added, right? And then you have foods like, you know, McDonald's and you have like charms and you have donuts and you have Cheetos. Those mm -hmm. are what are called ultra processed foods. So there are these mm -hmm. very highly processed foods and they're really the, the, the problematic ones when you look at the health risks. So just to make that distinction first, you're absolutely right about the challenges in these different contexts. So a big simplification, which is generally applicable, is that in high-income countries, we have a problem of excess ultra-processed foods. So in the US, UK, it's over half of our calories come from these ultra-processed foods. That's insane. That's just like most of our diet comes from that. That's not how we should be eating, right? That's the problem. Oh, yeah. And just real uh, quick, like from your quote, and it's not like you can just add in a bit of beef liver and all of a sudden you're fine. <laughs> no, you can't just add in some healthy foods and think that you're going to be healthy. Like the problem is that yeah. the big part of the diet is this, you know, crap foods. So that's problematic from nutrient adequacy standpoint. That's problematic from chronic disease standpoint for sure. But then when you get into context where people can't afford a healthy diet, uh, the problem is different, right? Ultra processed foods are not very uh, high in Africa. Um, they're increasing rapidly. So I think we need to be on the lookout, of course, um, we, and we need to try to address that. But the problem is uh, over-reliance on uh, starchy staple foods. So plantains, um, maize, so that's corn, um, wheat, rice, potatoes, cassava, any of these foods where it's, you know, it's not that people want to consume this as their large majority of their calories nobody wants to do that right they want to have a diverse diet they want to have fruits and vegetables they want to have meat you want you meat. Go, everyone's after you, meat over there I'll everybody in Af that. everybody in africa wants meat i think that's, i mean it's yeah. not like it's not 100 percent, but pretty much yeah. that's what they want to eat right so they can't afford it they can't access it it's not available that's i mean the diet is predominantly these starchy staples now that's not i don't think there's actually there's actually evidence to show there's an underconsumption of other plant source foods too. It's not just animal source foods. It's it's access to fruits and vegetables. Um, you know that's actually pretty low. Um, so nuts and seeds, pulses, oftentimes can be low in these contexts too. So I think there's a, in general, there's a there's something called dietary diversity. Like we need to diversify diets, and that is a big issue. And oftentimes that's for animal source foods, but it's also other uh, plant source foods. Um, so the issue is different in the context in different contexts and. Yeah, I mean, the, ultimately, though, what we see is nutrient deficiencies all over the place and rising chronic disease burden all over the place. So we see these joint aspects of 
uh, malnutrition happening at the same time. It's bad. And you know what? Actually, I observed there is a, a in between place, and I don't know if this has been studied or if you've seen this, but there's some people in say Africa that are undernourished, and yes, they have to rely on these staple foods that don't have many nutrients in them, and it's bad. Some people in Africa have the the processed foods come in, and they have tons of Cheetos and sodas, and I've seen that too. But I, you know what? I kind of saw a bit of of what America used to be like 40 years ago where they didn't have all the processed foods yet, all the ultra processed foods yet, and they were still eating pretty much a whole foods diet. And they did have some animal foods and they actually were pretty healthy. Like everyone under 40 looked fine. And they were, this was during the middle of COVID. They, they didn't even do COVID over there. They were just like rolling around like normal and everyone was fine. They were just like doing their normal thing. They, they actually seemed pretty healthy because I think they were, were eating, like I said, mainly whole foods. They got some meat. They didn't really have too many of the processed foods. Yeah. I think there are some of those populations in that sort of sweet spot. Um, and there are, there are different examples you can pull out, but certainly there's this trend of like, you go from an issue of underconsumption of, you know, not a diverse diet is transition. It's called the nutrition transition, right? You go into this like fully processed, highly processed diet and that's just like an inevitable thing that happens at populations when countries gain income, when they gain wealth. That's what happens. People desire to eat these more Western diets. And with along with that comes the all of the chronic disease burden risk as well. And I think that's the big challenge is like how do you how do you diversify diets? So get more access to animal source foods, fruits and vegetables, all sorts of different foods that are healthy and prevent this sort of transition. And that's where I think we have this issue with industry and, and the whole, you know, the whole corruption of what's the focus and, and what's being done. So I don't think like all industry is bad, but certainly there's high profit margins for these ultra processed foods. And they're what they make a lot of their money on and mm -hmm. they're being rewarded, you're being incentivized to, you know, try to grow your market share and deliver mm -hmm. to shareholders by producing these foods. So you got to do something about that. Like, you know, we can't, we can't just go from one problem to another problem. We have to figure out how to actually have both. Like, how can we be adequately nourished, but not, um, you know, not excessively fed? Well, their solution is always somehow a money-making solution. <laughs> their solution, it, their solution to hunger and nutrient deficiency is to centralize the system more or make fake meat products or, you know, it's, it's always kind of, oh, it sounds good sometimes, or maybe they think they're doing good, but really they're trying to make money and, and like control it. And I want to go back to the environmental stuff. Like you were saying before, it's like, yeah, of course there's major problems with how we raise animals and we have, especially pork and chicken. They're raised so poorly. They're in giant warehouses. They're fed terrible diets, all this type of stuff. But the people's solutions, they skip past all the things you said, regenerative agriculture and rotational grazing and mixed farming systems and like silvopasturing, pasturing, you know, like let's, let's run some ruminants amongst the trees and amongst other crops. You know, there's so many interesting solutions to grow plants and animals together. They skip all that and they go straight to, oh, well, the solution is to not eat animals at all. Or the solution is to make a processed fake meat, beyond meat, impossible burger. It's like, that's when I know it's bogus because they skip the natural solution that we've been doing forever, which is growing plants and animals together. And they skip right to the money-making solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's that definite, there's, there's that issue for sure. Um, there's also this, I think, positive aspect of industry where small and medium-sized businesses, they're called SMEs in this you know jargon term. Mm-hmm they're they're the ones who are doing things at a smaller scale it's not it's not centralized so it's decentralized these are you know small business owners and people in the country who are who are trying to make a living but they're not you know these are not the people who are just trying to make large corporate profits right so i think the the way forward is to really support those actors in the food in the food system like cuz most of our food even in rural areas most of our food goes through markets you can't avoid food going through markets and that's just the way our that's the way our food system works so you can't say like we're not going to work with industry industry's all bad let's just uh 
try to everybody produce your own food or share with your neighbors, right? So we have to work through industry and the and and markets and all that, but there's a way to do it. I think that's actually uh, productive and it's not you know not corrupted by just these seeking of massive profits. And that's the challenge. Like how do how do we support that? But you know, lots of organizations, including Gain, are working on that. Like we're working with small and medium sized businesses to support people who are producing healthy foods and um, you know, healthy types of processing or preserving foods, making foods more safe, get, improving access to people working in markets. And I think that's the way, the way forward, really. That's it. That's it. We just had a decentralization brunch at the Sapien Center in Austin, my new spot. And we were talking about th this is the way forward. And the ancestral health community is all about it. And I always talk about, yeah, going to your local farmer's market, completely different type of market than the supermarket. And even nose to tail, my company, we're trying to just skip the middleman, right? We just send people meat direct yeah. to consumer. Like that's the way. And yeah, I really think that's the way forward with health. Also, when you're talking about the nutrition problem, it's how do you skip the part where we just, they, the countries eat the highly processed foods, you know, as they modernize, it's, well, it's hard to do on a mass scale, but it, it's great that the ancestral health community, they, we've kind of gone back. It's like, we have to reverse out of it. And people are just going back to kind of the way we used to do it. Yeah, that's great to see. And I have, I've really appreciated that, you know, in the US and other other high income countries. But um, yeah, I think, you know, we need to have a multi approach that looks at or that it kind of seeks to address the issues in different ways. So supporting these businesses that are doing the things in this sort of more um, equitable way, you know, it's, in, it's improving people's livelihoods, um, but also trying to address the, the corporate influence, right, and trying to have, you know, shifting corporate corporations to more sustainable practices um, for mm -hmm. them to work with with um, the people that they work with or the the companies they work with to treat them fair to, to make sure they have the right practices in place and then trying to incentivize and I mean on the consumer side it's like how do you make this is a big challenge how do you change the appeal or the demand of foods if mm -hmm. there's this like uh, appeal to um, Western foods, which include all these ultra processed foods, what do you do to, 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 to try to address that? Well, you can try on that. You can try to prevent marketing, right? You can do things like that, but you can also try to like and generate them. It's called demand generation or demand creation. You can actually try to say, look, we're going to support, um, trying to influence people through, you know, nutrition education and through, um, appeal for this more wholesome nourishing type of diet. And I think you kind of have to do everything to try to, to try to make that change because the, the, the status quo is powerful, but like doing mm -hmm. nothing and letting just industry do whatever it is going to do. I've been to places like very remote parts of Nepal, of Vietnam, uh, you know, different countries where Coca-Cola is just like all over the place. I mean, you can't, mm. you could get a Coca-Cola in, just about anywhere. It's just kind of crazy. You know, in Mozambique, they pay for people's houses or businesses to be painted with their logo, with mm -hmm. Coca-Cola. So well, what are you going to do? Like you're a poor person who's looking to get paint. You just say, yeah, like, of course. Why is that okay? <laughs> right? Like, why is that okay? That industry can just, I mean, I was driving in, in um, Maputo, Mozambique. Almost every single building on many of the streets was just painted with coca-cola it's just like <laughs> it's the craziest thing to see yeah how are you going to fight against, how are you going to fight against that well that's a huge problem i'm I, i'm trying to do something that the previous thing you mentioned which is spread the nutrition education right and create demand there the food lies six-part series that's the whole goal go mainstream like let's tell the world about this let's get on netflix let's make this super entertaining super uh, enjoyable, engaging. And I think that will help. And I think that's yeah. a trick too, is when you don't crave those foods, it is a problem. Like these modern processed foods, most people crave them. They think they're super delicious. I've gotten over that kind of by just eating real foods enough. And, but you got to get people over that hump where they don't want it. Then they don't have to use all their willpower to try to avoid it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, 
it's a challenge. I think what, like for me, for some people, it's like, well, let's just try to moderate everything. For me, it's sort of like, I got to go all or nothing. Like if I'm eating a bunch of junk foods, that's what my body craves, right? That's like mm-hmm. what I want to eat. Uh, but when I'm eating, you know, what I, what I normally eat is just like very minimally processed, diverse diet of different foods. I don't have those same cravings. Like it's not that hard to not, you know, to not binge on something. But again, yeah, that's like, <laughs> Most people, they're not living in that type of world. Like you're constantly exposed. So even if you're trying, you go into the office or you go into wherever and there's candy mm-hmm. and there's pizza for lunch and there's cake for, you know, it's like, how are you supposed to like, if you're not somebody like you or you, you know, you or mm-hmm. me or your listeners where you're kind of very focused on your own health and nutrition, you understand things. How are you going to, how are you going to um, avoid that? It's just very hard. It's like, what, what are you supposed mm-hmm. to do? It's it's super hard, but and yeah, the corporate influence is huge, and we should talk about the Eat Lancet planetary health diet because I think that has a lot of of this corporate corporate influence that has shaped it. And I know you did a calculation from it. I just want to make sure people know what it is. I mean, this was this was pushed as what was it like nine? It was like a few grams of red meat per day you're allowed or per week. It was something crazy, and they have this idea of the planetary <coughs> health. It was supposed to be you know, for the benefit of people's health and the planet. And it's pushed, if you look into it, Frederick Leroy or Leroy did a, a presentation, multiple presentations, came on my show to talk about it. And he just traced it back to all of the industry funding and just all the, the influence that made these kind of crazy claims. Yeah, I mean, I, so I have um, colleagues on, uh, colleagues who are on the Eat Lancet, um, they're working on a 2.0 and, um, I, I don't um, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about the the political process other than I think there is an issue um, with not having the right balance of stakeholders and so I think yes there is that that wasn't um, you know especially in the first time that wasn't done properly uh, I think Walter Willett has who leads that who's a great person to interact with I I think he's really kind and um, genuine I think he has a he's he leads it and, and it's sort of like he has the he has the highest influence on what that looks mm. like, and it's hard to um, it's hard to counter that because he's a I think he's a really prestigious researcher. Um, I think he has strong views, um, and generally, I think he has he has good views on what what health is. But I think he's sort of hyper focused on this sort of like risk of cardiometabolic diseases as the only factor to consider, or the the, the key factor to consider, and sort of can miss seeing the importance of nutrient adequacy. Well, so yeah, sorry, I think sorry to cut in, but he has the wrong view, in my opinion, of cardio, like what contributes to those risk factors. Well, so okay, so me. yeah, so so let's let's look at the diet. I mean, the diet itself it recommends, I think, positive aspect, all minimally processed foods. So there's no ultra processed foods on the diet. I think that's a positive. Um, lots of fruits and vegetables. I think that's a positive. Whole grains, this is a controversial area. It's like an insane amount of whole grains, right? It's like, I don't remember the calories, it's like 600, 800 calories of whole grains. Mm-hmm. I think his view on, I think the view on the whole grains is a bit overstated. Again, for me, it's more like what type of whole grain are we talking about? And in the context of a diet, I don't think, I think whole grains, the benefits of whole grains are way overstated by whole grain enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think the risk or, or the, you know, harms in terms of like the, the ancestral paleo community, I think of whole grains and pulses, so beans and lentils. I think those are sort of um, a risk of antinutrients, I think, are overstated as well. So that's you know my personal view. When you look at the quantities, I think what's interesting is that the the amount of phytate on the diet is, ex- is extremely high. So we talked about phytate as an antinutrient. Well, the category... This is kind of crazy. The category for the recommended intakes of um, zinc is based on four different levels of phytate. So you have 300 milligrams, 600, 900, and 1200 milligrams. The unrefined diet. So we're talking about like a diet that's just like all unrefined, no, uh, you know, lots of whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. That has 1200 milligrams of phytate. You know, our analysis, we looked at the phytate in the Eat Lancet diet. Can you guess how much phytate is on the diet? Um, 
a lot. I don't know. More than twelve hundred. <laughs> it's more than double. It's more than oh, double no. the maximum amount for this. So we don't really know what the point of that is. We don't really know what the impact on bioavailability is. It's off the charts. Like if we're saying that the the most un, like the least refined diet that we are going to make a you know make a recommended intake for zinc based on phytate is based on twelve hundred milligrams of phytate, and you have twenty five hundred three thousand milligrams of phytate. We don't know what the impact on bioavailability is. And I think that's like, it's pretty telling just to see that the diet itself recommends that much phytate. So what we found when we looked at the adequacy of this diet, we found that for folate and vitamin A, you're fine. Like most of your needs are met, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much adequate in folate and vitamin A. But when you look at vitamin B12, calcium, iron, and zinc, it's not, it doesn't read the, it doesn't meet the recommended intakes. And especially when you look at iron for women of reproductive age, it's about 55% of the recommended intakes. So that's a significant, significant gap. And it's sort of promoted as a diet that's nutrient adequate. And so what we did is we looked at the, um, you know, the best evidence that we had on recommended intakes and the nutrient content in the diet recommended. So the diet itself, for the the this when I say the diet, it's sort of the point estimates of the Eat Lancet diet. So it's not like there's there are ranges, and it can go all the way down to like zero for some food groups and up to whatever. the 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 normal diet says, says fourteen percent of calories should be from animal source foods, so just fourteen percent. And the quantities I think you were asking about uh, red meat or beef, mm. it's like uh, seven grams per day of beef and seven grams of pork. So 14 grams of unprocessed red meat. So what that's saying is sort of like, if you go above 14 grams, it's not ideal for health. But but when we look at like guidelines, so you look at the the, um, the WHO guidelines on unprocessed red meat, it actually allows quite a bit. It's, it's 350 to 500 grams per week. So that's about, so that's about 71 grams per day, if you think of the upper limit. So right there, like there's an increased risk of cancer um, from the you know from the recommendations at least, and and potentially other non-communicable diseases above 71 grams, but that's quite quite a, a lot higher than than the um, e Lancet. So they have their reasons for it, and I'm not going to like argue with it, but I will argue with the nutrient adequacy because I mean to get the diet nutrient adequate without adding fortification or supplements, you have to increase animal source foods up about double. So 27%, I think, was what we had to do just to get it to be adequate. So that's pretty telling. A lot of increase in beef, increase in, in eggs and, and other animal source foods. So I don't know. It's like there are a lot of different views on what the, uh, you, you mentioned, like cardiometabolic health. And, and surely, like, you can have, for many people, it's optimal to have a low carbohydrate diet, you know, have a keto, ketogenic diet. Some people can do well on higher, higher carbs, but I think the, something that's undeniable is the, the adequacy of the diet. If you can't have an adequate diet, we shouldn't be recommending that diet unless we have a way to make it adequate. That's my general takeaway. It's like, what, what are we going to do to make this diet adequate? Right. Cause these are essential well, yeah. micronutrients. <laughs> well, that's what I care about. I don't care about if someone's low carb or keto or if they're high carb as I care about if they're eating enough nutrients, eating enough animal foods to get all those nutrients and eating whole foods. I, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I have gone away from dietary camps and just, I don't know if this is a camp, the camp of whole foods plus animal foods. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like let's, let's, yeah. do, let's make a camp of pure, uh, not pure, uh, fully nutrient complete diets with whole foods. That's my camp. And that should include animal foods. And I think more, I think more, I think more, people need to eat more. And maybe you, your personal view is there's a limit. Uh, I don't know if there's a limit. I think people have done great things eating tons and tons of red meat and reversing diseases and all kinds of interesting stuff. Not that they should do that forever or maybe, I don't know. I, I just I push back against this cardiometabolic. I don't know. People are saying like, oh, wow, if you eat this much red meat, you know, this is gonna, this is going to lead to heart disease, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I I think I'm I'm pretty with you on the unprocessed red meat. Like I, I don't think there's a I don't think there's an actual overall risk to health um, unless you get uh, quite high, uh, especially when you think of like in the context of a of a healthy diet. Like if you're eating 
Big Macs and soda, French fries with your red meat. Like, I don't think that's going to be making a, that's not going to be great. But again, it's like, well, I don't think the, the, I don't the, think red the unprocessed red meat is the problem, right? Like, yeah. that's not the main problem. I think there is a risk for, for, for very high intakes, but, and there's a, there's on the environmental side, I think there is a, there's a limit to how much we can produce sustainably, but we can produce quite a bit sustainably. Like there are a lot of rangelands out there. If you think about the ecosystems um, and yeah, I think at the individual level, so we talk about like people can do well on a lot of different types of diets, right? You can have some people have had six really big success on a carnivore diet, or if that's, that's sort of necessary for you to, to address your, um, you know, health conditions if you have some unique health condition then great but again at the population level i think the key thing when you think about takeaway messages like limit the ultra processed foods eat a wholesome diet based on whole foods and a lot of the risks for the chronic diseases i think goes away i think the issue that what what people don't really get is that it's not easy to meet your nutrient needs on our in our modern food system like, it's just not easy. You look at the nutrient deficiencies in, in high income countries and all over the place. You look at the adequacy of the Eat Lancet diet. It's not, um, it's not adequate. So you can't just, you can't just have a diverse diet and, or just go plant-based and assume that it's your nutrient needs are going to be fine. I think we need, to, we need to have a focus on nutrient density. And that's where, you know, talking about animal source series and also things like dark green leafy vegetables, um, you know, being important to, to help achieve that. From an ancestral lens, where do you do you think people were eating dark leafy greens in high amounts for all of history? Oh, I mean, well, history thinking, thinking, you know, ancestral lens is obviously much much more earlier than history. So, but so, I don't know. We don't know what people are eating exactly. What we do know, uh, I think, from pretty there's pretty strong evidence that the diets were orders of magnitude higher in nutrients than our current diets. I mean, you look at one of the key populations that or age groups is six to 23 months complementary feeding. You know, there's a study by one of my, my professors at UC Davis who looked at the nutrient density of, you know, diets from traditional hunter gatherers compared to modern cultures. And it's just like so drastically different. You think yeah. about the foods that are available. I mean, there's, they're eating, you're eating like uh, liver and other organ meats you're eating some of the most nutrient dense you're eating shellfish um and i think i don't know the history i don't know the history and, and what dark green leafy vegetables were consumed but it doesn't really matter like the nutrients in them are we have clear evidence of their very high nutrient density and you can talk about like oxalates or goitrogens or whatever and a nutrient you want to choose uh, but i'm not very concerned about it to be honest like when you look at the health you look at the health effects from the dark green leafy vegetables. I think they're like the evidence is pretty clear. They're highly nutrient dense and they're protective of health for a lot of reasons. They're rich in phytonutrients, fiber. So I'm not really concerned. I think if, if you're concerned about something like, let's just say, I, I don't know how detailed you want to get, but let's just say it's mm-hmm. goitrogens. Let's say you don't want to have kale because you don't have goitrogens, like, or you don't, you know, you don't want to have issue with iodine. Well, consume enough iodine, um, cook your kale. I don't, I don't eat a lot of raw kale anyway. I don't feel good eating a lot of raw kale. Steam your kale or something, right? Like, you just cook yeah. it. Um, oxalates, it's, I mean, if you don't want oxalates, eat lower oxalate greens. You don't have to have spinach. You can have other greens that are lower in oxalates. And again, it's like, maybe that's a problem for some people, but I think on the mass, we don't have an issue of like people are eating too many dark leafy greens and that's why people's health is suffering. So well, yeah, I, sort of, no, I yeah. don't think so. Well, I think there's, <laughs> I think a lot of people have had problems, and I am I'm one of them. And but I was eating them in in abnormal amounts a lot. So I think that's the problem: is people aren't eating seasonally. But I don't. But yeah, on a on a mass scale, there aren't people. The the modern the most of the people aren't eating that at all. But so I don't know if it's that helpful either. You know what I mean? It's like like no one's really eating them. There's a few. There's a subset of the population that eats an adequate amount and eats seasonally and has a very healthy diet otherwise and they're doing fine but also i'm not arguing about the the nutritional quality of them i mean i understand there are some like actual figures on the nutrients in them and that's fine 
Yeah, like for so for example, if you're gonna have let's just say you're gonna have um, a mixed mixed greens or something like a spring mix, it's mm -hmm. it's greens, dark leafy greens, different types. Um, you know, having that raw, it's like romaine lettuce, red leaf lettuce, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't see. I personally feel great when I have those. I feel just mm -hmm. fine. I can have a whole salad and I feel great. If I have a giant salad of rock hail, I'll feel terrible. Like it's not, it's just mm -hmm. not work for me. Some yeah. people it's great. And maybe it's about like your, your own uh, microbiome or your own personal characteristics. They can eat raw kale all they want, raw cabbage. I just like, I, I mean, I could have cooked, cooked kale or cooked moringa or whatever it is. And I will do great. So mm -hmm. again, so it's sort of like, sure. If you're, if you have a problem with certain food, just don't eat it or, or try something else. But I think there's a lot of this like hyper focus on maybe problematic compounds in dark leafy greens or other foods where it's just, I think misguided and it's not really, I mean, you can, you could create your own, you could, you could feel like you have certain problems and maybe it's, maybe it's not just that food itself, yeah. you know? So. Well, yeah, no, I, I'm not extreme on this. I just know that I had a problem because I was extreme in my consumption on them. But no, I mean, yeah, I know, I know there's other guys online that do a lot of content on this and get crazy about it. And I don't think that's the biggest problem at all that we need to focus on. But I also just like to look ancestrally. And, you know, when I did visit Af Africa, not that Africa is at all the same as it used to be either, but I'm, I'm just really curious about the, the really long periods of human history, like million year scale pre-human like what did we have access to we had meat we had animal foods and we had you know tubers and berries and i i think that's a that's like how animals develop their diet and they develop their digestive systems and they develop everything about them is based on their environment and their foods and it, and the i think it's perfectly adequate to eat a, a variety of whole foods right yeah. that were available animal and plant but i mean yeah. i think we ate like herbs i didn't think i don't we didn't have we know we didn't have kale we didn't have brussels sprouts we didn't have all these things they're, they're yeah we had we had crop we had wild we had crop wild relatives which herbs are pretty much wild that's why they're so spicy and flavorful so like you can get some hints at this question so going back to that question of what what type of dark leafy greens to, did our ancestors consume well when you look at food composition data so this is like databases in countries tanzania for example um mm -hmm. we used we looked at with zambia lots of other countries you can actually see what a lot of the traditional foods were these are like either wild type of foods that are harvested or people are producing these at small scale you see all sorts of stuff like you see all sorts of variety, indigenous varieties of dark leafy greens that are not around today. They're super nutrient dense. People have been consuming them for a long time. Now, I don't know about like millions of years, but definitely for hundreds of years, probably thousands of years. And I mean, at the same time, you see like, you don't just see the standard fruits and vegetables. You see really mm -hmm. nutrient dense varieties. I mean, there's a cucumber. I was looking at a Zambia database. There was a cucumber that was like super high in iron and other nutrients. Like that doesn't, that's not the case with our modern foods. Uh, even like some of the insects, you know, like caterpillars and stuff that are super high in, in nutrients. So when you look at these, these food composition databases, you actually realize there are, there is a huge diversity of foods that we had access to. And probably you're right. Like there's seasonal, there's different geographical patterns, mm -hmm. but we ate a lot of, you know, we ate what was available and we ate a, completely minimally processed diet right there were no ultra processed foods somehow we met our nutrient needs so the foods back then were much more nutrient dense wild foods are more nutrient dense uh, we've been breeding foods so when you think about how we've been changing our foods we've been breeding them to be higher in sugar higher in starch uh lower in fiber but these are for reasons of making them palatable and flavorful and whatever so now i think we're actually starting to pay attention to this or something called biofortification and that's really this process of breeding plants for nutrition and resilience it's trying to bring back the nutrition that we bred out of our plants so i think that's possible and we can get there where we can make changes to these foods so that if you just eat a diverse diet of foods hopefully at some point that will meet your nutrient needs 
we don't really we're not really there like we have to focus on nutrient density because our foods in our food system are not nutrient dense enough if you just choose randomly right a diversity of foods i think you're right and i think maybe that's why people need to eat so much dark leafy greens because everything's so <laughs> poor in nutrition and the soil's depleted of nutrients and all this stuff but yeah, yeah. I, I my current thesis is that yeah we had animal foods nose to tail we had you know eggs and shellfish and all these things we had some tubers we had some honey we had some berries we had some herbs and that did meet all of our needs super nutrient dense super diverse we had them seasonally and we had them in you know different amounts like i think that the, there, we weren't making gigantic kale salads or whatever the wild mustard, you know, the wild mustard plant was the original kale. It's not like that's all we ate every day. It was like, okay, yeah, let's grab some leaves. Wow, this tastes really good. Tons of good nutrients. And that's what I, that's how I use dark leafy greens. I mean, I have no problem with eating a salad, like a romaine salad. I mean, it's crunchy water, but yeah. like my dark leafy <laughs> green, like I'll eat some herbs, you know, like flavor that steak, like have it on the side, you know just complement it with some really, you know, nutrient dense, interesting herbs, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that when, I think the last thing I say is that you, like diversifying your diet where you have uh, a, a large range of different foods, I think is a good strategy for a few different reasons. It's good for nutrient adequacy because the more diverse your diet, the more likely you are to get different nutrient needs met. And it also minimizes the risk of any sort of uh, negative health effects of something very high in any one food. If you just consume a lot of one thing, it's there's a lot more risk to that. There's not checks and balances in the diet that will prevent sort of excess or um, you know too much of one thing or, or mm -hmm. not enough of another. So I think that's a good strategy in general, is just to diversify. But I think you're right. You know, nose to tail animal source foods are some of the most nutrient dense foods out there, and they should be a part of our diet for those who want to consume them. And they're an important way to meet your micronutrient and your overall nutrient needs. I love it. A little plug from nose to tail, my company, because we, we put in the <laughs> organs into the ground beef because it, you know, a lot of people don't want to do it. it. It's easier. It tastes better. I get it. I mean, I eat it myself. So <laughs> nice little nose to tail plug, which I, I don't really do because I don't feel like hawking my own stuff, but I'm actually really proud of my own stuff. And I'm you know, happy to work with these great regenerative ranchers in Texas, but that's enough. Let us know where we can find you. I know at least Twitter, you do some stuff on Twitter. Where else? And what is your handle? Yeah. Twitter is where I'm most active. Um, that's Ty R B L T Y R B E A L is my handle. Um, I just joined Instagram, so I don't know if I'll hang around there, but maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll start posting. I haven't posted yet. I did Instagram mm -hmm. live, same handle. Um, and then believe it or not, LinkedIn, somebody told me a few years ago, like people are active on LinkedIn. I was like, okay. So I, I started on LinkedIn and there's actually a whole different community there. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but yeah, I, I'm on Twitter. I think if you want to go to one place, go to Twitter. I love it. And anything new you're working on excited about? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Um, you know, some of the studies and we talked about this, uh, some of these comments on these papers that are coming out, we have those under review and, um, the, the Eat Lancet Adequacy paper is under review and hopefully that'll get published. But there's one paper I want to just mention that is in press. So it means that means it's it's going to be published soon. It's already accepted. And it's in the Journal of Nutrition. And I was invited to revite, uh, write this review of animal source foods and the role of their you know animal source foods in healthy and sustainable diets. And I, what I want to do, I, there's been so much sort of uh, criticism of people who have industry influence or you know people who are all authors of the same view. I wanted to bring people together who have different views. So we have, um, you know, I have Christopher Gardner, who, you know, very strong plant-based advocate, well-respected in the plant-based community at Stanford. He's a co-author, uh, Mario Herrera, who is on the Eat Lancet, who has um, a great scientist, but, you know, leans more plant-based. And then we have people like Anne Motet, who's at FAO, and it's a, is a really good, you know, advocate of animal source foods and livestock. And Laura Iannotti, who's, who's leading um, at FAO as well. This is the Food and Agriculture Organization. She's leading a, a systematic review of animal source foods and healthy diets. So I just wanted to like bring these people together and like, let's just try to get at the truth. Forget like whatever our biases are and whatnot. Like, let's try to hold each other accountable. And I think um, hopefully we got somewhere close to that. We, we somehow reached some consensus in, in this paper 
And hmm. it's, it's saying, you know, there's a role for animal source foods in healthy and sustainable diets, you know, and, and of course there's some risk. We talk about risk from saturated fat, processed meat and excess, you know, unprocessed red meat. So that's all in there, but it's, I think hopefully some, some, um, balance to the conversation where you have two sides often publishing on different, very sort of extreme views where hopefully this will be somewhere in the middle that can reach, a, a reach people and hopefully be more uniting than polarizing. Well, that's cool. It's good to hear that a plant-based advocate could be on that side. And I, I love that. We need more of that uniting and more of this message that animal source foods are good. So that's great to hear. Yeah. 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 Thanks for having me, Brian. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks so much. I'll see you. Take care.